This is uranium. It's used from everything from Art Deco dinnerware to atomic weapons. Uranium oxides serve as an important starting reagent for many uranium compounds. For example, uranium dioxide is crucial for uranium enrichment. It is used in industrial scale production of uranium hexafluoride, which is then spun in centrifuges to separate the uranium 235 from 238. The uranium fluoride system is fascinating, but that's a topic for another video. Today we will cover the uranium oxygen system, aka uranium oxides, which is an important starting point for many future videos. Since this is my first video on uranium chemistry, I want to cover proper safety preparation. If you just want chemistry, jump to this timestamp. Before beginning, it's crucial to set up the space for radioactive work. The work area is checked for contamination before starting. It is best practice to use a sensitive detector for the specific radionuclei that you are working with. A pure alpha detector would be best for uranium. A pancake probe will work, but more care must be taken to ensure area is properly surveyed. Anything over three times background is considered contaminated and must be properly cleaned. Once assured cleaned, absorbent paper is laid down. This will catch any contamination that may fall while transferring material or working with manipulation of the material. Equipment is then set up for the work being done. If high activity work is being done, a shield is put into place to block radiation. When working with radioactive materials, the goal is ALRA. It stands for as low as reasonably achievable. We limit exposure time and increase the shielding between us and the material. When working with uranium, the radiation is not very strong, so no shield is used, just at the methods of time limitation and distance. General safety equipment and a full lab coat with cuff sleeves is a necessity. Two layers of gloves are used, which the sleeves are tucked into. The outer gloves are changed whenever non-designated equipment is used or the hands are removed from the work area. When working with radioisotopes, dedicated equipment is a must to prevent contamination. There is more than just these safety steps, but to cover all those I need a dedicated video. Uranium is also a heavy metal, so alongside radiation precaution, Heavy metal procedures are followed. With all that out of the way, we can start the chemistry. Uranium is typically found in the lab as a few compounds with various uses. The most common is uranium nitrate hexahydrate, which will be our starting point. The first uranium oxide on the list is uranium trioxide. Heating uranium nitrate hexahydrate directly yields uranium trioxide. First, 5 grams of uranium nitrate is weighed out. The nitrate is then transferred to a 50 milliliter round bottom flask. Deionized water is then used to rinse the weigh boat and powder funnel to transfer the nitrate completely. The water also serves to dissolve the nitrate. If the uranium is left as clumps, then as heating takes place, the crystals will pop as gaseous products are made, leading to uranium leaving the flask. The heating is done on a hot plate started low and slow, below 100 degrees Celsius, as to not boil the water. Boiling may allow uranium to leave the flask. All the steps that are taken in this video are to keep the uranium as contained as possible and to ensure no contamination. The heat slowly drives off the water and after some time no water is left. The goal is to drive off any water before beginning the nitrate decomposition to avoid rapid boiling at the reaction temperatures. Once completely dry, the temperature is increased until it reaches 350 degrees Celsius, where the decomposition occurs, producing a reddish-brown gas of nitrogen oxides. The reaction also produces water and oxygen as byproducts, following this reaction. It is important not to heat too high, as a further reaction will occur, but it's pretty hard to heat that high on a hot plate. Alternatively, ammonium diurinate undergoes similar decomposition at 350 degrees Celsius, yielding uranium trioxide, water, and ammonia, following this reaction. As the reaction occurs, it turns to a bright orange color, the final uranium trioxide. The reaction is done when no more gas is given off and all is a uniform color. The next step is to turn off the hot plate and allow it to cool to room temperature. The flask and trioxide have different expansion coefficients and the reaction produces a gas, which leads to the trioxide debonding from the flask and can be easily removed. Scraping the flask may be tempting at this point, but doing so will dislodge fine particles into the air. Only remove large chunks with minimal force by pushing a spatula into the trioxide flakes. 
The trioxide is then transferred to a vial. The flask and funnel are then washed multiple times with nitric acid, which dissolves any uranium, reverting it back to the uranium nitrate, which can be used in the next runs of trioxide production. All equipment that was used in this run was rinsed with nitric acid a few times, and the washes were collected. A few routes can now be taken now that the trioxide is made. Due to it being more interesting, we will start with producing uranium dioxide. A few options for reduction can be used, such as hydrogen gas. This requires a tube furnace and reduction temperatures above 700 degrees Celsius. We can use only a heating mantle by replacing the gas with carbon monoxide. The gas changes the reaction and lowers the temperature to 350 degrees Celsius. We can make a reaction vessel by putting together a few pieces of glassware. A 50 milliliter flask will hold the uranium during the reaction. A distillation adapter connects the gas outlet and a gas inlet. The gas is much easier to push over the trioxide in a tube furnace, and due to carbon monoxide being lighter than air, the gas needs to be directed onto the trioxide. We can easily direct the monoxide over the trioxide by using a thermometer adapter and a graduated pipette. A heating mantle will then supply the heat for the reaction. Carbon monoxide is generated using a gas generator with formic acid and sulfuric acid. The gas was cleaned by bubbling through water and dried over calcium carbonate before passing over the trioxide. A variable transformer was used to control the power of the heating mantle. The switch was flipped on and the transformer was adjusted to supply enough power. The gas generator was started once the thermal couple read 350 degrees Celsius. Quickly, the trioxide turns to black dioxide. The reaction is complete when no uranium trioxide is present, which is easily seen due to the bright orange trioxide converting to the dark black dioxide. I allowed the reaction to occur over a course of an hour and increased the mantle temperature to 500 degrees Celsius to ensure a complete reaction. The reactor was then left to cool and the uranium dioxide was transferred to a vial. All the glassware and equipment was once again washed with nitric acid and those washes collected. Now with two oxides down, we can heat either at 700 degrees Celsius to produce triuranium octaoxide. One gram of trioxide is loaded into a crucible, which is then placed into an electric melting furnace. A lid is then placed on top of the crucible and the furnace is closed up. The furnace is turned on and the temperature is ramped up to 1000 degrees Celsius. After 10 minutes at 1000 degrees Celsius, the furnace is shut off and cooled to room temperature. The crucible is then taken out and our oxides collected. Here is our dark green triuranium octaoxide. Here is our three beautiful oxides we produce today. I plan to put them into many uses in future videos, exploring the uranium halide system and many other uranium compounds. These are not the only oxides that can be made, but they are the most common and generally used. A bunch of weird oxides can be made along with their hydrated forms. One such is uranium trioxide hydrate, which forms a bright yellow compound. For cleanup, all the equipment is washed with nitric acid three times and rinsed with DI three times. The paper mats were rolled up and stored alongside the outer gloves. The work area was checked for any contamination and none was found. The equipment and work area are now safe and clean, so we begin our next project. Thank you for watching, and if you have any questions, post those in the comments section below. 
You may have noticed that the sound quality of this video has skyrocketed compared to previous ones. I finally got rid of the $40 microphone I was using and upgraded to a nice Shure microphone. I plan to invest a lot more into the channel and hope that the investments pay off in growth. If you have any tips or any camera recommendations, please let me know. I also wanted to let you guys know that I'm moving all the shorts format videos over to a dedicated shorts channel where I'll post channel updates, short content, and regular short behind the scenes content. This is to declutter the main channel and have it dedicated to large videos. As always, thank you for watching to the end, and stay scientific.